It is Thursday, September 12th, 2013, and this is another episode of Athletics Talk Now. This is podcast number 118. We want to welcome you, Ace fans across the globe, listening on YouTube, iTunes, Facebook, and our website, which is athleticstalknow.com. We're a podcast and blog that celebrates the past and embraces the future of Ace Baseball. If you have the iPhone, just type in Athletics Talk Now on the iTunes app, and you can hear over 100 podcasts of me talking Oakland A's history. We're also at A's Talk Now on Facebook. Go ahead and like our page to see and read all kinds of great A's content for you fans. And joining me on the show today is one of the great A's great left-handed relievers in all of, in the late 1980s. He grew up in, in the A's farm system and had a nice 10-year career in the big leagues and still provides great analysis on the current Oakland A's. You can follow him on Twitter. That's at CADS32. That's at C-A-D-S-32. He's Greg Cataray. Greg, first of all, thank you for joining me today. And, and just two weeks ago, the A's had just a devastating loss in Detroit when Balfour, Balfour coughed up the, the walk-off homer to Torrey Hunter. Many wondered if the A's could recover from such a, a shocking loss. Well, since then, the club has gone 9-3, and three, and they're three games ahead of the Rangers with a magic number of 15 to clinch the division. Um, you've been around a lot of closed-door meetings. How did this team bounce back for, from such a devastating loss? Well, I think on the inside of the locker room, that wasn't such a devastating loss because they won three out of four from them. If it had been the first game of the series, you know, after it struggled a little bit in Baltimore, but a different story, you know. But they, they knew they were playing well. Those things happen. Uh, it's not fun because you've kind of already thrown that up in the win column. But, uh, you know, it, they're not strong at that time. They, they, they've been playing well, and they saw signs of their offense coming alive there. And they faced good pitching, did a good job against good pitching. So it's not as devastating the inside as it looks from the outside. 17 games left, Greg, and 10 of them are on the road, including three big ones against Texas this weekend. The A's are 37-34 and 34 on the road this season. How does Melvin prepare the team for the final push into the postseason? Well, I think you, you, you got to make sure they stay sharp, that they want to get it over sooner than later. You don't go into Texas thinking, okay, we have a three-game, three-and-a-half game lead. Uh, if we get swept, we're still in first place. You go in there thinking, we go in here, you know, we sweep them, we take two out of three, we just about put all the nails in the coffin, and things are looking really bright for us, and so that's the way you want to approach it. The voice you're hearing is former A's reliever Greg Cataray, who's on Twitter, at CADS32. Great A's analysis. Uh, Greg, during yesterday's game, you tweeted, what a difference since the Spettis is, start, is starting to hit to right center. Well, he's 16 for 38 and batting 421 in September, I, and I've always felt that he's at his best when he's driving the ball to right field like Josh Donaldson does. What has been the major difference between the Cespedes of last season and the one this season? I think that mostly. And, and what you see with Cespedes that is so different than, than most guys hit the ball the other way. A lot of guys hit the ball the other way. It's a single. It's a get a ball to the infield. His balls are off the wall. They're rockets. I mean, he hit one the first time, I think it was, that was on the ground and still rolls in the gap. You know, and next one he hits to the wall. So his power is phenomenal that way. And when it does that, when he does that, it allows him to stay on the ball so much longer so that when he gets the ball away, when he gets a chance to recognize that slider instead of starting to swing so early that he's trying to pull the ball. And then when they do hang a bacon ball, He's going to be able to pull it, and he's going to hit it six miles. So he'll hit just as many home runs, but he's going to hit for 40, 50 points higher on the batting average. That's a great point. And looking at the bullpen right now, uh, Grant Balfour, you, you were a reliever, uh, Greg, and, of course, he's a, he's a closer. What has been the big difference uh, since the post-All-Star break, Balfour? Obviously, he has a 4.676 ERA since the All-Star break. Is it just a little rough patch he's going through? Is there are there a major difference that you see? What do you see differently about what he's doing? I don't have a problem with what he's doing. The issue as a reliever is you have one bad day, two bad days. You don't get your ERA back down for a long time. So ERA is thrown <laughs> out, right. the, out the window as far as I'm concerned. You know? So for him, you know, he had a bad day where he is a four. That takes a month to recover from as a reliever. With Balfour, he has a tendency to be deep in counts a lot. And, you know, he's one of those guys that gets you on the edge of his seat. He walks some guys. But, I thought a couple of games were in Baltimore. He threw the ball as good as I've ever seen him throw it. I think he threw 11 pitches and, you know, every spot in the corner was a fastball, which is huge for him. With a reliever, you have times where there's a week there where you're 
your arm doesn't feel great. It's a little sore. Maybe you threw more pitches than you wanted to in a game. You know, you got off a, a long plane ride. You threw that day, and, and it hangs with you for a week or ten days. So you go through those little spurts during the year. And sometimes they don't need you on those days, and you avoid them, and nobody knows about it. And other times you just use three days in a row like you did, you know, and it takes a little toll on you. So they've given them a little rest here. He's had some opportunities, like the whole bullpen lately, where they're getting that day off in between. They're not going three days in a row, not as many high-stress innings. They realize they got enough guys down there that when they have a lead, it's Doolittle, Cook, Belfour. You know, Anderson has taken those three inning games where, and, and closed those out for them when they needed something for three innings and, and taken, not having to use three guys. And the depth is there. So I think they're getting rested. I think he's going to be just fine. And he's, he's the guy that's going to handle the best. Cook, to me, still emotionally doesn't quite handle that ninth inning. He's not quite as ready for it, you know. He can be lights out, or he can be wild at times and have trouble throwing strikes. So I think Belfort's a guy, and I don't think you need to worry about him. Speaking of, of Brent Anderson, you, meant, you mentioned it, and I asked you this yesterday. Um, he's been a starter most of his career, and the A's, of course, are using him out of the bullpen now. Once the postseason hits, should the A's make the, the postseason – would you just because he's a lefty? Would you start him and put him in the in the postseason rotation, Greg? As of right now, I think you only worry about him being a lefty if you have left-handed lineups. And from what I've looked at, I don't see anybody out there that has the left-handed dominant lineup. You don't, you know, you know, the Yankees in the past when they had Teixeira, Granderson, but Teixeira's not there. You know, so Detroit, you got Cabrera right hand, you got Fielder, but you know, the rest of their guys mostly are right-handed. You know, Boston, yeah, pop, big poppy, but still a predominantly right-handed team, especially if Elfenbury is not available to play. So, for me, I don't see that big left-handed lineup where you need that lefty in the rotation so bad. And I think he can play a huge role in the playoffs because it becomes a five-inning game for the starting pitcher so much in the playoffs and then matchups. And Blevins hasn't been as sharp as he was last year. And you get to the playoffs, having a strikeout pitcher is huge because you come in in more jams. And, and Anderson is more of a strikeout pitcher. So I think you might see him get shorter roles. Right now they've, they've kept their options open by they got some three blowout games that they can throw them in there, throw them for three, stretch them out a little bit, get them comfortable. I might, I think before you get to the end of the season, you're going to see some one-hitter lefties with them, one-inning shots to get them ready for that if the rest of the, relief, the, rest of the starters continue to throw well. If not, He's been throwing brainings. They could give him a start or two and get him ready for the playoffs. If all of a sudden you see Griffin uh, Australia really start struggling, but I don't think you're going to see that. Mm. Greg, how important was it to, uh, for the A's to reacquire Kurt Suzuki? I know a big issue uh, for me was in late innings and, and catchers, the A's catchers not really knowing how, how to block the split fingers or the sliders in the dirt and just blatant just pass balls. Um, how, how big of, a, uh, of an impact will he make defensively? So, you know, you're a pitcher to have confidence in throwing that nasty ball in the dirt that you know your catcher's going to be able to scoop it. Well, it was huge at the time. You didn't know if Norris was going to be out the rest of the year, you know, that toe. And, and it's allowing them to, to let Norris play every third day and be sure that toe is all right. When it comes to playoff time, I'm not sure what they're going to do right there. Um, both swinging the bat very well. He still defensively, to me, is the, is the third best catcher there. Um, he calls a good game. I think he catches the ball pretty well, but he's not real good footwork-wise blocking balls. The ball gets through him, tough pitches off the end of the glove sometimes in the situation. Suzuki is one of the better defensive catchers and one of the best blockers, no doubt, in baseball. So that's a big value there. Norris does a pretty good job. Jay, so I didn't think was a very good ball blocker at all. So for me, the big thing was they could get somebody in there that knew the pitchers. That was the key, is not having someone come in there and having to spend three weeks to learn the pitchers when you only had three weeks left, maybe. So that has been huge, and he is so good behind the plate. You don't have to worry about him at all. And he's been doing a little bit offensively for him, too. So it's been, it was a good, the best possible pickup for them without costing them much and, and fit right in. That, that was the best move they could make. Mm, switching over to third base, I think, Greg, all of A's Nation held their breath last night when Josh Donaldson was hit on the hand in the third inning. He's in the lineup today, so I guess he's feeling okay. What was going through your mind, Greg, when you when you saw him hit in the hand uh, that inning? Well, that worried me because, you know, that was the one tweet I had, too. That's the one guy they can't afford to lose. I don't think they have uh, a man, someone that can fill that position, you know, very well, though it was a big move when they got Kayaspo because he can play third, and they didn't have anybody really in the organization that could really play third. I mean, they were playing Barton at third base in AAA quite a bit. So, 
They need to keep him healthy, and he's a guy that can carry him on our back, but he's so overlooked defensively. He's one of the best defensive third basemen in the game, and you think of him as a, as a former catcher. People don't right. realize that right away, but Machado, Longoria, those guys have nothing on him defensively. He makes all the plays, and he's huge for that team, and, and he's right in the middle of that lineup. So the big thing was when I saw the replay, he got his hand off the bat because if you get your hand on the bat, it gets crushed between the ball and the bat. That's what usually breaks things, and he actually got his hand off the grip off the bat, and that uh, looked like he survived okay. How does how does a, a former catcher like you mentioned, Greg Josh Donaldson, become one of the best third basemen in all of baseball, and, and putting up some of the best offensive numbers in in all of baseball? With he's he's up and up uh, in the big leagues in multi hit games. It, was that just is that just hard work opportunity? How would you uh, describe that? Some of all the above, you know. Um, he's a really good athlete. He hadn't been catching for 20 years where his knees were broken down and the agility was gone. He's a very agile guy, great arm, and a lot of catchers can play third base because they're willing to get in front of the ball. They're not, they're not a laying ball down there. They're used to being on top of things and taking balls off their chest, and they usually have strong arms. But he takes it further with his agility and the range he has. And he's done a great job there of being aggressive. And then hitting-wise, he's hit better than I thought he would, and a lot of that is because he is willing more than anybody else on any team hit the ball to right field, and he drives the ball that way to the point where sometimes he looks surprised. He hits the ball to stand there for a second and realizes that they're going out or they're going off the wall. He has tremendous power the other way, and when he starts struggling, he remembers he goes back and starts using right field more, gets himself back in a groove, and then you start seeing him hit home runs again. He's swinging good right now, and he can keep on asking the guys in the heart of the lineup between him and Lowry. Those guys are going to carry him through the playoffs. Let's talk about first baseman Derek Barton. Uh, just a very polarizing figure to many Ace fans. Uh, you either love him or hate him. He's been in the A's organization since being acquired in the Mark Mulder trade in 2004. Uh, this guy is hitting 359 with nine RBIs in 14 games since coming up on August 26th. And he's hitting 462 with runners in scoring position. He's making a case to be in the postseason roster. Could this finally be the, the time that Derek Barton stays in the big leagues, Greg? I think it could be. I know I talked to Steve Scarsoni and Greg Sparks, uh, the manager hitting coach down in Sacramento and um, down there, and he said he was just the best professional hitter they had on the team. He's good at bats. He's gotten more aggressive. I think part of the things in the past have been some high expectations for him, and there wasn't a lot of other expectations, a lot of other prospects out there, of course, when he was here, and, and so people wanted more out of him, and he was pretty passive out there, and that drove people nuts a little bit. When the one guy you felt like had an opportunity to be Especially he wasn't getting it done, so it drove people a little bit nuts, you know. But he made the adjustment. He's understood the, the differences he had to make, and and he got a lot more aggressive with counting his favor, especially early in the count, and realized that, you know, when you got a guy in the in the spot to drive and run, you don't necessarily want him to walk. That's the one thing that Jack Cust, those guys would drive me nuts, is that okay, you walk, but there was a man on second with two outs and nobody on first base. That didn't really hurt the other team. Sometimes you have to expand your strike zone a little bit, not get crazy. But you have to take a pitch on the corner and get a base hit, get a sack fly, and get that run in. You don't want to pass out on the next guy. If that guy was better than you, he'd hit in your spot. So you need when you're in the middle of the lineup, you need to do those things. Now Barton is down the lineup a little bit, a little pressure off of him. He's doing a great job, and you know what's overlooked is how good a job defensively Brandon Moss has done in right field when they put him out there. I think he's an above average fielding first baseman, but he went out in right field and hasn't missed a beat. Showed a good arm, good range, and I was huge when uh, Reddit was out of the lineup. You know what's interesting, Greg? It's actually remarkable about the A's organization. When you see these these seemingly mediocre players getting opportunity, and all of a sudden you see the Jed Lowry surfacing and the Brandon Mosses. It's just amazing that that this is the perfect combination that you know a mediocre player or a B list player gets an opportunity and does some great things for a team. Well, when people have confidence in you, it makes all the difference in the world. And when people take you for what you are and don't try to make you something different, you know, if Jed Lowry, people know he's not the best defensive shortstop out there, but he's adequate. So you take him for his bat and say, we're happy to have his bat. If you want to harp on his defense the whole time and be disappointed, you know, that, that's when you start having problems where you just understand this is what the guy does well. Brandon Moss swings the bat and try to hit home runs. This is fine. Don't try to make him, you know, a 350 hitter. So that's, and they've shown that these guys have this opportunity. And for most guys that play, to get to AAA, get to the big leagues, they have the talent to be there a lot of times. It's like when someone says, 
A-Rod does all this stuff. Well, if somebody else was sitting in the four hole, they would drive in 100 runs there too. They might not drive in 140, but they're going to drive just because of the opportunity you're going to get that in the Yankee lineups and stuff like that. So the guys there have the talent. They might not be superstars, but the A's treat them. And as long as the players remember that, we're part of the whole puzzle. We're not one big guy that does it all themselves or we need to be treated special. These guys all understand the platoons. Melvin's putting them in the best possible situation. They've seen the results, so they trust them. And they all play for each other and do their parts, and they're happy that way. They're understanding that. And you can play a long time in the big leagues until you're on a winning team, and then you get on a losing, you realize how much better life is and what you give up to play on a winning team. Everything's better. Your home life's better. Your camaraderie of your teammates, no arguments. Everything's better when you're winning. And when guys realize that and they buy into it, you come up with something special. And he's had that the last couple of years. And you obviously had a nice 10-year career in the big leagues. And and you played in with the A's in the late 80s. And we, there was always Captain Carney. Carney Lancers was the captain of the infield at the time. They called him Captain Carney. Is, does the A's of 2013 have a captain? You know, Carney wasn't necessarily a captain. If, you know, it was, he was red ass to us, you know. But his way he went about his business <laughs> is what made him a captain, you know. In the locker room, those guys, the teammates know who you look to, who you listen to. It's not necessarily the public. You know, it's just someone that might be a quiet word. It might be a guy that 10 guys in the locker room don't realize as a leader, but he comes by and, and taps a guy on the shoulder and says, hey, you know, we're going to need you today. I'm expecting you to get a big out here or, you know, be ready to hit in the eighth inning. One of those things that Johnny Gomes embraced so much of looking forward to hitting with a game on the line instead of worrying about hitting with a game on the line. So the, the public might not know it. So they probably got – half a dozen guys in there that do it. And, you know, Stu took care of our pitching staff. Stu was our leader there, you know, and so there might be a guy in charge of the pitching staff. Balfour probably handled the bullpen. Eck was big in our bullpen, but Eck wasn't necessarily the guy that, that was leading it down. And he came down the seventh inning. He had honey cut down there more when I was there. So you have guys that step up or the people follow by personality that outside the locker room nobody even knows about. Final question for Greg Cattery, and I want to thank Greg for joining us uh, on the show. Um, I know the magic number is 15, Greg. There are still 17 games left, but if the season ended today, the A's would face the Tigers again in the first round of the ALDS. Of course, they went five games last year, great series. If the A's were to overcome the Tigers this season, what needs to take place for this team to advance to the ALCS? I think some of it's actually already taken place by playing so well in Detroit, you know, a couple of weeks ago, um, Verlander is not as dominant as he's been, which was big against the A's last year, getting him twice in a five game series when he was at his best. Um, and they've proved they can beat everybody else there. I think they've set themselves up well, you know, men- on the mental side of it and believing in themselves and against Texas. They know they can beat Darvish, you know, so they they're in a position now where they're not wondering first time you get the playoffs, like last year, you're saying, can we beat these guys? What do we do? We're not experienced. Now they've been through it, and there's no doubt in their mind they can be anybody they're going to have to play. So they have confidence going in there, and that's all they have to remember is what we did all year, did last year, we deserve to be here, and this year I think they'll go further. That's Greg Cattere. I'm Dale Tafoya. And, Greg, it's about 9.54 a.m. The A's are going to play in about 20 minutes. Are you going to kick back and watch the game? Yes, I am. You know, we got, got it on. There's a little pregame show today, so – Got the TV on and, uh, you know, get a little snack here and sit down and watch the ball game. <laughs> Great stuff. Thanks for listening, Ace fans. And Greg, thanks for joining us. I enjoyed it.